Well, good evening, everyone. I know that uh, over the um, current weeks in your plan, you're looking at different aspects in relation to one very important theme, that of the kingdom of God. And last week, you considered the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ in relation to that kingdom. And our brief for this evening is to consider what has been described in the title of our subject, the idea of right justice. And it's very relevant, I think, that we should be thinking about these things at this moment in time. Uh, we're just almost, I suppose, thereabouts halfway through what has been described as a, uh, an election campaign in this country by the various parties who would govern the United Kingdom. And they've been putting out their various stalls, their manifestos, they've been talking about what they're going to spend, uh, how they're going to raise that money that they need to spend, and they've been telling us what they're going to do uh, to make life better for us all in this country. And uh, the Conservative Party released their manifesto this afternoon. And in, in each of those manifestos, there is, we believe, or at least we're told there is, a commitment by the different parties, whichever manifesto we're looking at, by them to do something for you and for me and for this country. Now, when you look at what they're offering, money for the National Health Service, raising taxes to do this or to do that, bringing about Brexit and various other things, you'll find in what they have to say nothing to do with right justice because it's completely foreign to what they intend to bring about. They are hopelessly inadequate, as history has shown. They do not have the qualities or the power, even if they have the will at times, to deliver what has been described in our subject title as right justice. And so for a few moments this evening, what we want to do is to show you very clearly from God's word of truth, the Bible, that there is only one solution. There is only one way out. And it is the coming of the kingdom of God. The re-establishment of God's kingdom upon this earth with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, at the head as the king. So it doesn't matter what Mr. Corbyn might say or Mr. Johnson might add or the various other uh, party uh, leaders uh, who might say what they're going to do. Even if they had the power, everything would pale to insignificance when we consider those things that we're going to look at for a few moments this evening. So with that in mind, let's look at the contrast together. Let's look at what God's message is. And in fact, look at what his manifesto is. But certainly a manifesto totally different to those that you'll be reading about in the newspapers over the coming days. I'd like to go to the Old Testament first of all, and I'd like to go to the prophecy of Isaiah. We're going to look at Isaiah on several occasions this evening because Isaiah is full of things that help us understand what God has in store. And I'd like to go to the 32nd chapter, and I want to just pick out a couple of verses where we see the aspect that we're considering this evening regarding right justice mentioned. Now, in Isaiah chapter 32, the chapter begins, a king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule in judgment. And you'll see there the word righteousness. Come down, if you will, to verse 16. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. So several times in those few verses, we see the word righteousness. Or we might say right-wayness. Or we might say, as some 
translations, mod more modern translations than the authorised version, write justice. In fact, the revised version uses the idea of justice on several occasions. So, righteousness, or right justice, that's what we're talking about. And it is the foundation stone of what the kingdom of God is going to be based upon. And immediately we can see this contrast, can't we, between the politicians of the world, the leaders of the world today, and the way in which they operate and work. The contrast between them and what we read here through the prophet Isaiah that God declares. So he is saying to us in his divinely appointed word that a king is going to rule or to reign and he's going to have this particular quality. Right justice or righteousness as our versions in front of us probably have. And the result of that is going to be transforming. Yes, the Labour Party might talk about transforming things, but nothing like this that we've just read in verses 16 and 17. Because the effect of having this quality, this quality that is only available from the Lord God Almighty himself, is that there will be peace, assurance, and quietness. What a contrast to those things that we've heard people say recently, or we've read recently, regarding their plans for this country. Peace, assurance and quietness, and even these things, not just for a four or five year term of office, but forever. Now I suggest to you that no politician would in their imagination try and suggest that they would do that because they would fall flat on their face straight away because they would not be able to deliver having not the power to bring these things about. But let's just consider this word of righteousness for a moment in a little bit more detail. If you look at a, a, a Bible dictionary or indeed an ordinary dictionary for the word righteousness, you will get words such as right, just, straight, without prejudice or partiality. And immediately we can see the change that this language brings to the world and its politics of today. That that is right... That that is just, that that is straight, and that that is without partiality or prejudice. And God, in his mercy, is saying to us through the prophet Isaiah that he is inviting us to think in terms of a kingdom that has those sort of things as its very foundation. So immediately, the question is asking us, isn't it, well, who do we want to follow? Would we wish to follow the world's leaders or would we like to look a little bit deeper into these things that are contained in the word of God? Well, come with me, if you will, to the reading that we had um, from the... Psalms and Psalm 72. We'll come back to Isaiah, as we've said, in, in a moment in time. Psalm 72, again, if you just quickly glance down this chapter, you'll notice contains our word righteousness or right justice. Verse 2, for example, He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. Or again, verse 7, in his days shall the righteous flourish. So now referring to a group of people having this quality 
that God will use as the foundation stone of his kingdom. And then we can see the wonderful picture we have in this psalm of what this right justice will bring about. So what God is offering to the world is a kingdom. And you've already begun to establish that uh, in previous addresses. This kingdom is going to be completely different to the kingdoms of men. Whether it's a king or queen ruling or it's, it's a group of politicians uh, of a particular party ruling, the kingdom of God is going to stand out totally different from all those. Justice and right wayness is going to be the order of the day. There will be an honourable way of dealing with matters and God sets the standards in what he has outlined in Isaiah and now in this 72nd Psalm. So the message of the Lord God Almighty really to us is that there is a change coming. There is a time coming when he is going to openly intervene in the affairs of man and he is going to rule this earth. And it's going to be an everlasting rule and people will give praise and honour and glory unto the living God of heaven and it will be the Lord Jesus Christ who will execute these wonderful qualities that bring about, as we've said, the peace, the assurance and the quietness that Isaiah 32 talks about. Now, if we look a little bit closer now at the 72nd psalm that we had read for us. I hope that we can begin to see that this is really something exciting that is being opened unto us. Exciting because it is full of great hope. We hear quite often of the difficulties that mankind faces whether it's collectively or individually. We hear of those problems throughout the world uh, and even nearer home at times of difficulties that are occurring. Well, when you read Psalm 72, you can see a real difference because unlike the world in which we live today that is ruled openly by politicians, albeit with God's hand at work, this is with God's full power demonstrated, this idea of his kingdom of right justice. So let's go back then to verse 1 of this psalm and let's pick out some of these things that show to us what the plan of God is, what he intends to do and how his kingdom is going to be very different. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. And we probably should stop there and say that this is a psalm penned under divine inspiration by the psalmist David. If you look at verse 20, for example, where we ended our reading, it says the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. And although there are other psalms later on that deal with uh, David's uh, hand at being upon them, up to now, these 72 psalms have clearly been psalms penned by the shepherd king of Israel, the one who was chosen by God. So it's David, a man after God's own heart that the Bible tells us he is, who is recording these things and he talks about a king who is going to rule with this divine quality of righteousness or right wayness right justice call it what you like it stands out as we've said from everything that we see today from a politician or from a king or queen and his judgment is going to have the impact of teaching the people 
of how they should live and order their lives, of changing the world so that there aren't the problems that we face today, and bringing about, as we've said, this wonderful picture of peace. This is in God's manifesto, not in the manifestos of men and women today. Have a look at verse 4, for example. He shall judge the poor of the people, he shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. And in many respects, we have a little cameo picture of some of these things uh, that have already occurred in history. Because after the reign of David the king, his son Solomon reigned. And because of the work of David in the preparation for the kingdom of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel that Solomon ruled over, Solomon had a period of 40 years peace. Not without his own personal problems and his own testing of his faith, but nevertheless as a nation they had rest from their enemies because of the work of David. And in some of what we see in the history of the kingdom of Solomon and his 40-year reign, we see a cameo picture of what's going to be in the future. Solomon, the nation, had peace. Their old enemies were silenced, at least for a time. And God says through David here in this psalm, that that picture is going to expand it and made a picture that will be seen throughout the whole of this earth. Such is the purpose of God to intervene and to bring about a world that is at peace and a people that will give him the glory and the honour that he intended from the very beginning. Look at verse 5. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. Fear of God, reverence of the almighty creator of heaven and earth, something again that is absent in the world in the main today. Or verse 7. In his days shall the righteous flourish. So here's the call to you and to me. If we want to look forward in hope to that time to come, then we have to ourselves take seriously this idea of righteousness and right justice and the qualities that God speaks about through David in this psalm. In his days shall the righteous, and that can be us, if we put our trust and our confidence in the Lord God of heaven, shall the righteous flourish in abundance of peace so long as the moon endure. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. But yes, I can hear people in the world saying, well, that's all right, but look at the problems there is. Look at all the difficulties that, that there are. We've seen the protesters, haven't we? It, it, you know, bringing almost London to a stop on occasions and various other cities for one reason or another. Because they want to influence change and bring about things that are on their agenda. Well, the Lord God in his mercy, with his right justice, is not going to be unfair He's going to be right. His hand will be right. He's not going to show favour to one and not to another. The work of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be balanced. And those who are accepting of God and his ways, God will remember and provide life even everlasting. And verse 16 tells us that the Lord God recognises the difficulties that there are in the earth. But that time is going to be such a remarkable time that there, there will be a handful of corn on the top of a mountain. Such will be the ability, because of this right justice, this different approach, 
this wonderful foundation that the kingdom of God is based upon. Such is the difference that nothing will be impossible because it is the Lord God who will be in control through his son, not a politician like Mr Corbyn or Mr Johnson or whoever else, but the Lord God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, bringing about these wonderful things. And if that wasn't enough, when our president read this psalm, surely verse 17 stood out to us in, in its reading. His name shall endure forever. His name shall con be continued as long as the sun, and men shall call him blessed. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth of wondrous things. What a marvellous picture that is. And in just two passages of scripture so far, Isaiah 32 and this Psalm, Psalm 72, we've seen that the basis is right justice, righteousness. God, who is faithfulness itself, has promised through his word, as we're beginning to see this evening, to bring about these things, to make the world a place of plenty and to make the world a, a place where people give him the praise and the honour and the glory. And we're being invited to listen to these things and to put our confidence in the living God of heaven. Well, come back with me, if you will, to the prophecy of Isaiah now. And let's begin to develop this picture that is painted for us regarding the kingdom of God being based upon this new approach, this right wayness, this right justice. Now, I'd like to go to Isaiah chapter 2, first of all. In the opening verses we are told that the prophet Isaiah saw, that, saw these concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And that is, of course, an area of the earth today that is a, a, a place of difficulty and problems from time to time. Interestingly enough, they've had, I think it's at least two elections in Israel this year already without much of a, uh, an outcome. Um, showing the instability of those who rule today upon this earth. But this picture talks about a complete change. And with that very characteristic of God, of righteousness, it is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his saints, the chosen ones, to bring about this picture of change. And in verse 2 we read, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it and many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And then in verse 4 it goes on to talk about the impact of these things upon war, for example, when there will be no more war, but there will be peace, and all the efforts will be to bring about a true and a lasting peace. The word of the Lord from Jerusalem. What a contrast to what we see today. That's in no manifesto, is it, that we've heard about recently, but it is God's plan to bring that about. Through his righteous rule in the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be the word of the Lord seen to go forth from Jerusalem itself. No longer the, the words of Arabs and Jews arguing. 
disputing this piece of land or that piece of land, but God's message from Jerusalem, which uh, you may cover in another aspect uh, in relation to the kingdom of God and the city of Jerusalem. Come forward in Isaiah then to Isaiah chapter 11 because we get back to this key principle in Isaiah chapter 11 regarding righteousness again. And in verse 1 we're told, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And so we see this descendant of, of Jesse, of King David of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ, described here as the branch, is going to bring about this remarkable change to the earth. And again, notice the words that are used by the prophet Isaiah. Verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And if we stop there again for a moment to reflect upon those words, what profound words they are. The spirit of the Lord providing wisdom and understanding to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. No politician can measure up to that, can they? No way at all. And of course, as a result, they lack the ability and the power to deliver quite often what they want to do because they're just not able to do it for whatever reason it might be. And then verse 3 goes on to say, and shall make of him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall, and notice this, not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Remember those definitions of right justice, no impartiality, no favouritism. Here it is again, but rather, verse 4, with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Every passage so far that we've looked at has had a very close link with this very important word of righteousness or the idea of right justice. And that's no surprise, really, because it's at the very heart of what God is going to do. His kingdom is not going to be based upon the favours that he might give to one or to another because he doesn't work like that. The Brexit party may be suggesting they've been promised positions in the House of Lords to stand down from various seats, but we shall wait and see. But the Lord God Almighty, he doesn't work like that. He's above all that because he is the creator of all things, that giver of every good and wonderful, perfect gift that he gives to us each day, not least the, the wonders of creation all around us that give testimony to his power and to his might. No, he, he's not like the politicians of the world who have to choose somebody because they owe them a favour. He is going to stamp his rule and authority through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the very foundation of all that is going to be this idea of right justice. If you go to verse 5 of this same 11th chapter, it says, And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The idea that faithfulness is linked here with righteousness. The Lord God is faithful. And we see this binding together of these two important principles of righteousness and faithfulness. 
And the effects of that, well, verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that is what is on offer to us all, my dear friends and young people. That God's kingdom that will be established will be a totally different kingdom to the kingdoms of men. God will rule through his son. And the way in which that will happen will be that God will provide to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, this right justice, this righteousness. And with great power, he will bring about God's plan and God's purpose. We've looked so far in, in the Old Testament, but I think it's important that perhaps we go to the New Testament to pick out the idea of um, this quality. You've already seen the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ in relation to his kingdom. So I want to go to the Acts of the Apostles, if we could, um, to look at um, a couple of verses. First of all, to Acts chapter 1, to, to remind us um, where we are in the New Testament regarding the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 1, the Lord Jesus Christ has already been put to death and has been raised again by the Lord God Almighty. And in Acts chapter 1, we have his ascension into heaven. And there's a promise given here by the angels that stood by who witnessed these events. And the promise that was given was that they would see the Lord Jesus return again. That is, the disciples would witness the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So just look at verse 11 of chapter 1 of the Acts of the Apostles. It says, Ye men of Galilee... Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So the Lord Jesus Christ, who was now leaving behind his disciples, was prom it was promised of him that he would return to re-establish God's glorious kingdom. Then come to Acts chapter 17 to some words in the teaching and preaching of the Apostle Paul. Now the Apostle Paul here is in Athens where he has witnessed the attitudes of those people of the day who would worship almost anything. And he's seen the inscriptions, he's seen the, the idols to the various gods that they believed and trusted in. And he noticed one where it was recorded that it was to the unknown God. And the Apostle Paul begins to teach them at Athens regarding their superstitions and their concerns leaving out uh, anyone to worship and therefore they had this idol to the unknown God. And he describes this in verse 30 of Acts chapter 17, where he says, the times of this ignorance, this ignorant worshipping of, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent or to change. And so that's the message to us this evening, really. It's the, it's the same message today, that we need to change from the ways of the world to the ways of God. We need right ways of living. Our thoughts and our actions need to be right. We need to think in terms of those teachings and laws and those standards that God has laid down for us in his message of truth, the Bible, which can lead us and guide us and help us in our search for truth. So the Apostle Paul says, God winks at this ignorance concerning their worship. 
And then this is the real verse we want to look at, verse 40, 31 rather. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. Notice the word that is used here in the New Testament and there are other places we could go to. God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in a particular way. It's righteousness or right wayness or with right justice. We're back with that very foundation upon which the kingdom of God will be built. That that is right, that that is just, that that is honest. That is the way in which God will rule and his son will rule with that power given to him by his heavenly father. And that's what we're told in the second half of this verse. Because he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So the clear message of the Bible is that God's kingdom is going to be totally different to the kingdom of men. To the rulership of mankind that we see today, that history is littered with. Politicians come and go. They rise and they fall. They carry out their, their purpose according to the will and hand of Almighty God. But they're soon gone, as will some of the ones we see pushing at the moment for votes and for acceptance by the United Kingdom people. But there is coming a time that will be totally different. The world will be transformed because God's kingdom will be based upon something pure and honest, upon this right justice or righteousness. And we can trust it, we can put our confidence in it because God's hand is at work among the nations and we can see that even today, preparing a time that day appointed, as Paul has said here, for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. When that promise given to the disciples is fulfilled. So God, in his mercy, is going to establish a kingdom. It will be very different, as we've said. And the result of this will be peace and righteousness. Peace even forever. No more problems, no more difficulties. I suppose the question that has to be answered this evening is a very personal question and we have to ask it of ourselves, each of us in turn of ourselves. Are we interested? in real change? Are we interested in everlasting life? Are we interested in peace upon this earth? Well, if we are, then there is only one way to achieve it, and that is for the Lord Jesus Christ to return to establish God's kingdom. And I'm sure our prayer is that each and every one of us might in that day be found ready and judged acceptable according to God's mercy and grace so that we might behold and witness that right justice that will transform everything in front of us, that will transform this earth into a place and to a people to give God the glory and the honour. <laughs>